Police officer turned killer, Rosemary Ndlovu. Rosemary Nomia Ndlovu. He's convicted killer, Nomia Rosemary Ndlovu. Has been Rosemary was one of us, but she was dangerous. There were 76 stab wounds to his body. She makes sure that this person is dead. She poisoned her own sister. Ending the lives of six family members. All about helping evil to her own family. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today and I hope everyone is doing very well. Last week we spoke about the case of Frank Ndebe and how he caused absolute chaos for the woman in Mpumalanga and if you haven't seen that video I'll link it up here for you. But today we're going to talk about a case that is very shocking and I do just want to say that I do not think that every cop out there is bad and actually every cop that I have had to encounter sadly under very distressing circumstances has been really good to me and very kind and very sweet but just like in every single industry or every kind of workforce there are bad apples within the system and today we are going to talk about another bad apple and that bad apple being Rosemary Ndlovu and with that being said let's get into today's case intended for mature audiences only Today we are starting off in Bushbuck Ridge in Pumalanga, where Nomina Rosemary Ndlovu was born. Rosemary was born in one of the surrounding small towns called New Forest, and this all happened in 1978. Here in New Forest, everyone supported those around them, and there was a love thy neighbor sense of community here. Rosemary had six siblings, and according to Rosemary's siblings, they grew up very well. They did not have a large amount of money, but the Nandlovu family worked very hard, and their parents worked hard for everything they had. The children worked around the house as well, collecting wood, attending to the field with their mother, and apparently also playing very nicely together. Rosemary's siblings would say that even from a young age, Rosemary knew that she wanted to be a police officer, and that is exactly what she would work towards. People who knew her said that she was kind, loving, and that she would also hold her sister's hands when walking to and from school. And she would also wait after school for all of her siblings. She was protective, intelligent, hardworking and loving. Rosemary was said to never have bullied anyone in school. She never back chatted a teacher, she was well behaved, but the only negative thing that her siblings had to say about her was that she had an incredibly short temper and that she would snap quickly but was never ever cruel to them. So during school Rosemary's grades were very good and once she finished high school she then left to the city of gold or as we know, Johannesburg, South Africa. Here, she felt that the grass would be greener, opportunities were going to be rife, and that she was going to be able to send money back home to her mom and to her family back in Pumalanga. So Rosemary started to work in the police force, and she tried to work her way up. Then, in 2014, a new police station was created, and that was Tembisa South. And then Rosemary was transferred to this police station to work here. And even when she worked in Johannesburg, her colleagues there would say that they felt an unease about Rosemary's presence. And then when she moved to Tembisa South, there were also reports that Rosemary's presence towards her colleagues was very unsettling and they often felt uncomfortable in her presence. And for example about this, her colleagues were always nervous about Rosemary because often guns would go missing from the armory and Rosemary was actually found with an R5 rifle from the armory. And when one of her senior officers asked her, why do you have this weapon? She just said, why not? I don't understand why I can't have it. So she eventually then just put it back because she now believed that she couldn't have it. But then whenever they went back into the armory, she would take the weapon that she was allocated, but then she would also take another one. So the second time she then walked out with another nine mil. And so the process kept going on and she was constantly with weapons on her person that weren't allocated to her via saps and what made her colleagues so uncomfortable was because of how brazen she was she wouldn't really care about what other people said she would just do what she wanted to do and felt that it was okay or it was justified and then at the end of every month rosemary would call in sick it was almost known as rosemary day or rosemary week coming up because of how often she took off every single end of month period she liked gambling she was always there she could even, like, not go to work, but go for gambling. She even won a car. 
But then her senior officers would say, okay, well, she's not only taking off the end of the month now, it would be periodic as well. So now she would take off in the middle of the month as well. And she would just hardly be at the offices. But even though Rosemary loved her job, she would often take off. But then also, just after Rosemary started in Tembisa, she then was at a roadblock with one of her colleagues. And while at this roadblock, she then met a man who was stopped in the roadblock called Maurice Mombasa. And the two kind of hit it off right away. They then exchanged numbers in this roadblock. And after then, it just became history and the two started dating. But to Maurice, this relationship was very serious. He was going to propose to Rosemary. And also in 2015, they did end up having a daughter together and their daughter was born in April of 2015 and her name was Makanani. But if we go back to the thought of Maurice proposing to Rosemary, when Maurice introduced her to his family, a lot of his family didn't like Rosemary at all. Firstly, one of Maurice's sisters said that she would often carry this black handbag with her all the time and inside this handbag would always be a weapon of some kind. She would always have a gun on her and she was always armed and then not only that but she would also have a very quick temper with Maurice and she would often shout at him. Her demeanor would just change if he irritated her in any sense and she was very apparently aggressive towards Maurice. And so Maurice's mother really didn't like Rosemary and she was not very keen on the two getting married. But apparently after Makanani was born, they really felt that this baby brought them together. And a lot of people saw that once Maurice and Rosemary had a baby, they did seem quite close. However, newborn life is apparently very difficult. So the realities of a newborn kicked in very quickly. And even though the couple was happy for the first couple months after having Makanani, things started to go sour pretty quickly. And often Maurice would sleep in the car he would often not be at home because Rosemary would kick him out they would get into altercations and things were just very volatile not only that but rent was also not being paid there was some discussion about who was supposed to pay rent and things just got really ugly very quickly and now there was the pressure about paying rent and the landlord breathing down their necks as well but eventually Maurice had had enough and he then called his friend one day to come to the house and pick him up in his bucky and the two of them would then go away but However, when Maurice did call his friend, Rosemary happened to come home that same day. And when she came home, she saw this bucky or pickup truck parked in the front of their home. And when she saw Maurice walking outside the house with bags, she said, oh, no, no, this is not happening. And Maurice, you are going to come back inside right now. Maurice was not listening. He was adamant. He put his bags in the back of the bucky. And so Rosemary just turned around. She walked back into the house, dug into her bag and then walked out with the nine millimeter. She then walked straight up to the driver, Maurice's friend, and then she pointed the gun straight at his face and said, listen, you better take your bucky. You better leave and not come back here. And no, she didn't say it in so many nice words, but she told Maurice's friend to get out of here and Maurice is coming back into the house. So now being threatened by gunpoint, Maurice's friend then got out of the bucky. He took Maurice's bags out of the car and then he gave them back to Maurice and Rosemary and her boyfriend Maurice then went back into the home. But then on the 12th of October 2015, Maurice Mombasa was reported missing. And when reading this article, the police who commented on this particular point in this case said that it was very strange the way that Rosemary went about reporting her partner missing. Because we got to remember, Rosemary was a police officer. She did missing persons cases almost every day. She knew that she needed specific things in order to create the missing persons case. You can't just come up there with their name and surname. That's not going to help police officers. So she knew that she needed a recent photo, details, what he looked like, what he was wearing, his age, his date of birth, everything like that. And Rosemary came with nothing. She didn't come with the photo. She just went to the police station on the 12th of October and said that her partner is missing. So her colleagues that she went to at the police office said, thanks, Rosemary, but you got to go home. you got to give us more information. But Rosemary didn't return for a couple of days. And when she did return, she then runs into the police station, runs straight up to the desk. And then she said they found Maurice's body. Hey, so if we take a step back on the 15th of October 2015, an unidentified male body was found in an open field near a couple of homes. So police were now looking to see who this person was. Like I said, he was an unidentified male. Police were called on the morning of the 15th to go and see who this guy was who has been murdered, how he was murdered, 
And when they looked at this body, they found about 250 rand on his person. They also found two bank cards on his person and a tie, but no other identifying factors. So police are busy investigating. And while police are investigating, Rosemary then runs into the police station and says, they killed my husband, they killed my partner. And the police at the front desk, they stopped and they said, Rosemary, what are you talking about? What do you mean they killed Maurice? So then Rosemary decides to explain. She's like, oh, the guy in the park is Maurice. And the police behind the front desk were like, how do you know it's Maurice? We didn't say, and he's unidentified. There's no ID on his person. And then Rosemary kind of stopped and she kind of like had her eyes roll in the back of her head. And she then passes out in the front lobby of the police station. And then she would kind of come to and she would kind of get out of her daze. And then she would start crying and she would start bawling her eyes out. And then they would ask her more information about how she knew that this was Maurice's body in the open field. And then she would fall over and faint again. So this kept happening on and off until the police inside the police station called an ambulance. An ambulance then came and took Rosemary away. And as a side note, she was there with Makanani at the time. So they were now worried about this young child who Rosemary rocked up at the police station with. But they then called Maurice's brother and sisters. And then they came and collected Makanani later on. And they would then take her away. So while Rosemary has now been whisked off to the hospital, hospital via the ambulance, police are still investigating this unknown body inside the field because the people who are dealing with Rosemary at the station are not the officers that are with apparently Maurice's body. But news eventually got to the officers on scene and they were told that this is possibly Rosemary's partner Maurice. So the police officers now had this in their mind and they started to look at Maurice's body with a different color lens on now. So the police then got all the evidence they could from the scene. They then put Maurice into an ambulance and then with him off to the morgue to get an autopsy done. So in the morgue in Germiston was where Maurice Mabasa's body was and the chief officer or the chief examining officer there at the time said that Maurice's injuries were horrific. He had over 70 stab wounds, he had bruises all over his body, he had a few broken bones on his body, it was a very brutal way that he had passed away and he specifically sustained blunt force trauma to his head, to his torso, to his legs, to his arms, but specifically around the neck and head area was where most of the blunt force trauma was. But like I said, police back at the police station were doing their job in terms of investigating and having a look at the crime scene. And they saw that Maurice still had most of, if not all of his money that he had on his person still with him. So the police then immediately ruled out robbery. Clearly that wasn't a motive because the money was still there. And then when they got the report back from the morgue or from the examining officer, they then had a look at all of his injuries and quickly realized that this is most likely a crime of passion in some sense of the word because there were so many stab wounds and the examining officer said that only two of these stab wounds would have been necessary in order to kill Maurice. There was no need for them to stab him again over 70 times when, like I said, only two would have killed him. Another finding that the morgue found was that there were old bruises on Maurice's face. So he had a black eye, he had a few cuts in his scalp that were quite old. They looked like they had been there for at least a day or two. They weren't fresh from the scene. So that means that it's most likely that Maurice's body was somewhere else and he was kicked, beaten, punched a couple of days before he was actually murdered in the field. So if we go back to Rosemary for a second, the last time we left her, she was still in the hospital shaking off her shock. And when the doctors felt that she was all right and that she could go home, she then went home. And when Maurice's family came to her home later that day, she said that the house absolutely smelled like jick. It stank so much that it burnt their noses when they went into the home. And they were there with baby Makanani and they felt like it was uncomfortable and it wasn't a very safe environment for the baby to be with such strong chemicals in the home. So they walked in and they opened all the windows to try and get the smell out. But one of the sisters that was dropping the baby off said that it was incredibly strange for the house to smell so clean because she said that she was one of the people who helped clean Maurice and Rosemary's house because Rosemary hated cleaning. If she could get away with not doing it, she was not doing it. So Maurice's sister, one of them would come over to the house to help clean the house. But she said that everything was clean. The tiles, the grout in between the tiles was clean. 
the curtains were bleached as well. Like everything smelled like bleached, even the bottom of the chairs, like everything. But it also seemed like people were too scared to stand up to Rosemary because even though people felt like she was very suspicious and she made everyone uncomfortable, nobody really stood up to her and nobody really took her on because they thought that they could lose their lives as well. And also because Rosemary was a police officer, she knew exactly what to do she knew the processes and she was a very intelligent lady she knew what she was doing but according to some gossip or some report this was not the first time that someone tried to take out maurice apparently about a month earlier in september of 2015 maurice was home alone sleeping in his bed when all of a sudden he woke up because he smelled so much smoke and when maurice then got out of bed he saw that his entire bedroom was set alight maurice then hops out of bed jumps over a couple of flames to get out of the house immediately. Luckily, Makanani was not at home at the time and Rosemary was at work. But what Maurice found suspicious when people came to the house to try and put out the fire was that Makanani's clothes, a lot of them had been removed. Also was her birth certificate was missing and Rosemary's ID was all taken out of the house. And once the fire was put out, Maurice just happened to look under the bed and he saw that there were bottles and bottles of petrol underneath the bed. And if these bottles of petrol had caught a light exactly where he was sleeping, so it wasn't on Rosemary's side, it was only just under Maurice's side of the bed. And if they had caught a light, the flame that would have gone up and how quickly that would have accelerated would probably have killed Maurice or at least done an extreme amount of damage. But after Maurice's death and a couple weeks later, Rosemary then walks to one of her superiors and she then hands him a couple of life insurance policies. And while she's talking to one of her superiors, the guy who was actually going to be assigned to the case later would overhear their conversation. And he could kind of hear that they were going back and forth in conversation, but there were no raised voices. It was an incredibly chilled, very calm conversation. And then Rosemary just walked out with a stack of papers in her hand and then the kind of suspicious officer walked into the guy who just signed all the papers and he asked this officer what did you just sign that Rosemary walked out with and he said oh no it was a bunch of life insurance policies so this cop then sits there and he's like but why did you sign it you know that this case hasn't been solved yet and apparently the cop that he was talking about is kind of under investigation for incompetence but it's not quite clear. However, this cop then decided that he's going to take over Maurice's case and he's going to do everything. So what he then did was he then called Rosemary back and said, you need to come back to the police station right now. I need a copy of every single policy that you just asked one of my colleagues to sign. So Rosemary does come back to the police station. They then photocopy all of the documents and then this cop then takes everything and puts it inside a docket of Maurice's death. So because this officer was now dealing with Maurice Mombasa's murder, he decided to keep his distance from Rosemary completely. He let her kind of live her life. He let her walk away with the insurance policies for a little bit and he wanted to see what was going to happen. In the background, he also took a copy of all of her phone records, her bank statements. He was really working behind the scene in trying to get as much information out of Rosemary as he could. But he wanted to make sure that she didn't suspect anything and she went on like nothing had changed. So while this whole investigation is going down, like I said, the officer over Maurice's case was very diligent in how he worked this case and he made sure that he dotted all his I's and crossed all his T's and made sure that there was enough evidence that was going to go forward and that he had an unbiased case against Rosemary if it was Rosemary who killed Maurice. But if we take a step back from the case for a second, while Rosemary was actually at home, she had a friend come and visit her and the friends are talking and baby Makanani was now in the high chair, one of those high chairs, and she was apparently making a lot of noise. She was just fussing around doing what toddlers or babies do and she kind of was making a bit more noise than Rosemary appreciated. So what happened is Rosemary then walked over to the high chair allegedly. She walked over to the high chair and then she kicked the bottom of the high chair's feet out from out of its place. So then the high chair kind of buckled over and baby Makanani went flying and the friend just kind of like looked in absolute shock and she's like why did you just do that? It's a baby. It's a toddler. Why would you do that? And Rosemary was like because I want Makanani to know that if I say no 
it means no. And she's not going to learn unless that's how I tell her to do so. So the friend just kind of hurried up on what she was eating, what she was doing, and then she just left. And she said to police later on in trial that if this is what Rosemary was doing to her baby while there were people around, imagine what she was doing to her loved ones and her baby when there was no one there. So back to the investigation. And while Rosemary is being investigated, this officer who is investigating Maurice's death sees that there are so many inconsistencies with not only the policy but with what's written inside the policy and also Rosemary's stories but if we go to the policy for a second or policies what this officer did was he enlisted the help of a handwriting expert a signature expert and he asked her to have a look through this case and through the policies to see why all the signatures and handwritings don't match so what happened according to the handwriting expert is that allegedly that the handwriting in all of these policies do not match any signature from Maurice Mombasa. And I'm talking all of these policies. And we'll get into how many later. But the handwriting experts said that they do not match. This is not Maurice. And also that the information that's listed within the policies looks like someone wrote it. And then they were being dictated to. So they crossed that out. And then they wrote something else. That wasn't right. So they crossed that out. And surely if you're writing this from you, if you yourself are writing this, you know how to spell your name, you know where you work. Yes, mistakes do happen, but generally you will make one mistake and cross it out and then write whatever details you need. But this crossing out seemed to be a consistency throughout all of the policies. There were also reports from a police officer with inside the station that said, firstly, that he feared to come forward because of Rosemary's demeanor and he really did fear for his life because of Rosemary. So he didn't report this earlier. But he did say that just before Maurice's death, that Rosemary asked him and called him saying that you know how to be very quiet. I know that you can be discreet in certain circumstances. So can I ask you to help me to try and find someone who can take Maurice out? So this police officer firstly said, no, I'm not going to help you with a hitman. And so Rosemary just kind of played it off. And she was like, oh no, I was just joking. I don't really want a hitman to help kill my partner. And they kind of just left it there and he felt very uncomfortable by it. But it always stuck with him, that conversation. And later on in trial, he would talk about it. However, there were also rumors that a couple days before Maurice's death as well, Rosemary borrowed 10,000 Rand to give to a hitman. And then a couple of days later, Maurice was dead. It wasn't only that she hired this hitman to kill Maurice, allegedly. She also apparently took this person to the life insurance companies to pretend to be Maurice. And that's why all the signatures and all the handwriting in the different policies looked different because they were from different people. And the police officer who was investigating the case at the time actually went to one of the life insurance companies such as Old Mutual, for example, Absa, for example. And he went to these companies and took a picture of Maurice and said, is this the guy that was the guy who signed these life insurance policies? And they were all like, no, that's definitely not him. This lady brought a completely different man. In total, Rosemary allegedly took out 16 life policies on her partner, Maurice Mombasa. And if Maurice passed away, based on all of these life insurance policies, she would get just under 500,000 rand. So as soon as the investigating officer found that these policies were fake and that they were forged by Rosemary possibly and another person, he then shut these policies down. He emailed each and every single insurance company themselves and said, listen, we're investigating this. We're pending an investigation on the death of this person. Don't pay out anything. So the life insurance companies were like, okay, we'll shut this down. But what about the other life insurance payouts that we've already paid Rosemary? So the investigating officer was like, what do you mean the rest of the life insurance policies that you already paid out? Apparently, like I said, Old Mutual, Absa, Hollard, Avbob, etc. A lot of these companies had already paid Rosemary out for previous life insurance claims that she had taken out on her other family members. So the investigating officer immediately went back to the police station. He went through the archives and he saw that there were at least five other people that Rosemary had claimed or put life insurance policies on. In 2012, Rosemary's sister had passed away under very suspicious circumstances. Then a couple months later, her cousin passed away. Then Rosemary's niece passed away. Then in 2017, Rosemary's nephew passed away. 
actually he was murdered and the day before he was actually seen with rosemary and then the day after he had been murdered so one day he was fine the next day he was murdered then in january of 2018 Rosemary's other nephew was murdered also just being seen with Rosemary a couple days prior to his murder so there's at least five people who have suspiciously had life insurance policies taken out on them with Rosemary being the beneficiary but then the investigating officer said that we kind of need to do something bigger we got to dig deeper here and clearly there's a pattern on how Rosemary is targeting people obviously she wants and she's going to run out of money soon so we need to think of a better plan so what the investigating officer did was that he then asked one of his police officers to go undercover with a friend and asked these two to pretend to be hitmen. And what Rosemary wanted this hitman and her cop friend to do was to organize the murder of one of her sisters and her sister's five children. And what she wanted was for them to be burnt alive in their homes while they slept. So Rosemary had no care at all of who she was going to take out. At the end of the day, these people, her loved ones, her family were chicks and obstacles in the way of getting her money. And by the way, for her two nephews, her cousin, one of her sisters, as well as her niece, for those five people, allegedly, Rosemary got just over 1.4 million rand of life insurance policies for them. But in 2018, that is how Rosemary and Lovu was caught. She was caught on tape asking for a hitman to kill and murder her sister and her family. Rosemary's trial was said to be very entertaining to the people who were in the courtroom. Sadly, not so entertaining to the people who lost their loved ones by Rosemary, allegedly. But in the end, in 2021, Rosemary Lindlovu received six life sentences plus 30 years. Then another 10 years based on four counts of fraud, another 10 for each person she planned to murder, and another 10 for attempting to murder her mother as well. Like this case is absolutely insane what Rosemary and Glovu went through to try and get life insurance money. And to most people, when you think of family, you think of a closeness, an unbreakable bond in some instances, and also just a place of safety. But clearly this is not what Rosemary thought about her family and her friends and her loved ones. Like we said, they were a means to an end to a paycheck. And I'm not sure if it's still the case at the moment, but life insurance policies in South Africa are very easy to take out on someone else. You didn't always need the person's consent in order to take a life insurance claim out on them or policy out on them. If you wanted to take a life insurance policy out on your friend or your father or something, you didn't exactly need their permission to do so. You just needed signatures. But I'm not sure if it's still the same. It might have changed after this because of how Rosemary was able to bulldoze her way through these insurance companies. But let me know what you think of this case down below. It is very strange, very sad, and incredibly heartbreaking for all of the families and people involved. But like I said, let me know what you think of this down below. I hope you all have a great day further as much as you can. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.